Saints have gone. We're not the heroes. Uh, thank you, whoever bought these. I did buy some prizes for today, but I ate them all last night. Uh, actually, that's not quite true. I didn't eat all the what are the horrible coconutty ones? I still didn't eat the Snickers. They are the devil's chocolates. Peanuts. Blah. But I ate some of the um, what are the coconutty ones? Bounties. I, I ate some of the bounties because I can choke those down because they've got chocolate on them. But I, but I did eat the rest. Good morning, everybody. It's absolutely champion to be here. It, honestly, goodness, it really is. It's great to be anywhere. It, um, I, I, Colin said to me, you're not going to preach in your, in your Christmas jumper? I thought, no, it's, I'm absolutely sweltering. Today I want to talk about the, the kings, the magi, the wise men um, in, the, in the Bible story, in the, in the scriptural story, in the, the Christmas story, if you like. Uh, so obviously our first reading is from 2 Kings 6. So, reading from 2 Kings 6. When the servant of the man of God got up, went out on the, early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. The baddies were there. Oh Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So see, I think, I think you can see where we're going with this, can't you? Oh, look at your faces, obviously not. <laughs> In that case, let's jump back to Matthew. Uh, we are a little bit. I'll tell you what, if Joe hadn't said, you went a long way around this midweek, we'd have gone a lot further, I promise you. <laughs> okay. We're going to come back to that, just in case you thought I'd gone completely mad. We are going to come back to that. Uh, but we're also going to go to Matthew 2. The, um, the, uh, the bit that you would expect me to read when I was going to talk about wise men. So Matthew 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. When, the, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. This is not in my notes. That word disturbed there, it's, it's the word used for boiling water. It's like it was roiling. They were, they were rolling. Everyone was just, oh, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he, he King Herod, had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked, sorry, he asked them, anyone would think I'd never read before, wouldn't they? <laughs> he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will become a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. That's Micah, Micah 5.2. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and went, Shh, come here, come here, come here. And found out from them the exact time the, the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me that I may too go and worship him. After, that, after they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the child, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Lord, this morning, we've heard what a great God you are. We have sung what a fantastic, unchangeable Always for us, God, you are. Lord, this morning, Lord, help me to, to use different words to say just the same thing, that you are fantastic, that you are for us, that you are the best for us. You have the best for us. 
Lord, let, let my words just, just fall to the ground. Lord, let your words enter into our ears, into our hearts, produce the harvest you desire. So, don't you love the way Scripture says so much and so little at the same time? That's why I started with the Elisha verses. Not because because like the servant, we can see, but so often we don't perceive. We can see the situation we see. So we can, so we can see, we, we read, read, this, read this, this account that says flat facts and we see it and we don't, so often we don't see what is there. So Magi came from the east and because we know, because we, since we were, I was just seeing a little child. Since we were that big over there, as big as that little baby there, we some of us have some of us have heard this story not in an awful lot of years. I'm sorry, mate. I looked at you there. That was my apologies. <laughs> uh, some of us have, have seen it for significantly less years, and then some of us we've all heard this story an awful lot. So we just so we just oh, maybe I came from the east. Oh, I'm all right enough because that happens all the time. No, no, it doesn't. That's not at all reasonable. It's mad. With these these people of a measure of wealth and power and influence at home, decided to schlep hundreds of miles at Christmas time when the roads are jammed always. I mean, imagine if they had to come past Meadowall. That would have been terrible, wouldn't it? I'm going to blow my nose if that's all right. Just because they'd seen a star. Just that one's a star there. So the, one day, they're watching repeats of Big Bang Theory on, on Dave. The next day, they're packing all the valuables and what one can only assume is quite a large retinue because only idiots wander about with gold, incense and myrrh without bodyguards and cooks. And they're going a long way, so they'll have, had, they'll have, they'll have to fetch some snap with them and they'll have fetched money for the snap and cooks and chefs and, and guards and... and Oh, there would have been a cartload of them. So when we read, they went into, into Jerusalem and, and the city was in turmoil. Well, of course it was. Because there was a cartload of these foreigners had just turned up. Everybody must have been going, who are these lads here? Well, what, what are they doing here? Why, why have they come here? The city would have been in turmoil. And Christmas as well. <laughs> They've gone to a foreign land, a foreign empire. See, these lads aren't Romans. They're from the east. They're from the east. And, and Rome's in the west. Over there. So, so what, what, what caused this, this, this extended ramble? Not mine, theirs. <laughs> I can see what some of you were thinking there. Felt it. I didn't even have to look up and I felt it. A few years, a number of years before, when, when the Jews have they've come out of Egypt and they're tonking round, before they go into the promised land, they get into a bit of a rook with a king called Balak, B A L A K. And Balak sends for a wizard to curse them. He thinks, Oh, I'm going to, I'll get the wizard to curse them. So he sends for the wizard, and the wizard comes, and the, this is in Numbers 22 to 24. Numbers 22 to 24 is one of the funniest bits of the Bible, it properly is. If you want a good laugh, read that because it's really funny. There are also a couple of, hang on a minute, what happened there? Moments. A couple of those just, you know, sometimes when you're reading, reading scripture, and you're like, you get to the page, you turn the page, and you're like, hang on, have I, have I missed a bit here? There's a bit, you just don't see. But anyway, long story short, instead of cursing the people, Balaam blesses them repeatedly. And, the, and, God, and Balak says to him, curse these people, curse these idiots for me. And Balaam goes, bless these idiots. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, curse them. Okay, okay, this time, this time. But anyway, so his final words in num Numbers 24, Balaam says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab. The skulls of all the sons of Sheth will be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered, but Israel will grow strong. 
a ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. And they must have all been going, oh, crikey, that doesn't sound like a a curse at all. That sounds like a blessing. And then Balaam, it's the scripture says, and then Balaam got up and went home. And you've got to think, when he got home, he went, I'll tell you what I've just seen. A star's going to rise up. But not now, in a bit. So we need to look out for this because something is coming. And since they were astrologers, since they, these magi were, were they, they worshipped the stars, they looked to the stars for, for portents and signs, it's not unreasonable that when they saw a star rise in the east, they thought, it's time. This, this, it's time. It's time to get up and go. If they had been... If they had been into Haruspice, what would they have looked? No. If I'd have said Hepatomancy, there must be a doctor in the house that knows what Hepato. Liver. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, Barbara. <laughs> Hepatomancy. Hepatomancy is, is examining, is, is telling the future by looking at largely sheep and chicken livers which um, haruspice is other in, looking at other internal things sorry I don't want to give kids any nightmares <laughs> yeah so they, they looked at the stars it's not unreasonable they were, they were expecting this to happen it, was, it wasn't just it wasn't just the, the chosen people they, they wasn't just the chosen people waiting for a messiah well, the, chosen, the, the Jews were waiting for a messiah they'd been waiting for one for yonks these lads have been waiting for something as well. They've been waiting for the King of Kings to arrive as well. And we don't see that, but it's true. That's one of those things that we just don't see. So from the Matthew 2 reading. How many wise men were there? <laughs> no, it isn't. We have, we have no idea. At least two. Um, there, there were three, yes, that is favoritism. Uh, there, we don't know. <laughs> to, to be honest with you, it seems to me a bit lazy to say there were, th- well, there were three gifts, so there must have been three kings. Really? If, if you're a... If you're a, 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 a I'm going to start you to stop using the word kings. I'm start using the word major. Because uh, you've got to think, if there, were, if there were kings, part of you thinks they would have stayed at home king and sent somebody else. Do you know what I mean? If, if you're a king... Uh, you're not going to schlep hundreds and hundreds of miles away and leave all your subjects alone to decide that you're not the best king they could have and put somebody else in place. So, major. So, so three seems a bit... It's like, oh, there were three, so it must be three. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. There are traditions in the Syriac church that there were actually 12 kings, uh, major. Although, to be honest, that does seem like quite a lot. But... Maybe they had a cartload and just like, oh, you guys go, be right. More than Actually, yes, that's right. Maybe they thought it was a match on. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, Boxing Day as well. Boxing Day match. There's always a football game on Boxing Day. Do you know, this is why I married this lass. She's a genius. <laughs> She's a genius. Right. We don't, we don't know how many kings there were. Um, thank you. <laughs> Honest to goodness. What were their names? Yes, they were blah, 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 and blah, blah. No, we don't know that either. There are lots of, lots of different traditions say lots of different names. But we, do, we don't know. They're not, it's not written down. I mean, we know the three lads in the, in the, in the oven, they were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These, these lads, no idea. Reading a bit about them in Wikipedia... Obviously. <laughs> why, go to a, why, why go to a concordance when you look in Wikipedia? It seems to me that, that wherever you are in the Eastern world, you think one of them came from where you are. So if you're in Syria, oh yeah, they definitely came from here. If you're in India, oh yeah, they definitely came from here. If you're in China, oh yeah, yeah, one of them definitely came from here. So you're like, okay, right. And the one thing we can be fairly sure of is none of them came from here. <laughs> Possibly. 
No, this, there are no wise men in Barnsley. <laughs> Some wise guys, but no wise men. So, <laughs> Hera, the, the, one of the things that started me thinking about this, um, it, it was actually wearing this shirt. And genuinely, this, this, one of, uh, somebody came to me last time I was wearing it and said, oh, I, I love your shirt. I was teaching the, the kids in my class about the person who painted, who painted this. So, who painted this that I'm wearing? No, she was close because she pronounced it right. No, Piet Mondrian. I'm going to give you a chocolate even though you're wrong. <laughs> because it's not. It's not a Mondrian, it's a fake. It's a counterfeit. It's after, in the style of Mondrian, but it's not a Mondrian, it's a fake, it's a counterfeit. Apart from anything else, there's not enough white. And the, the black lines are too big, and you don't get these three colours together like that in Mondrian paintings, you just don't. Um, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. Yeah, I'd say that's true, it doesn't have buttons on his paintings either. So that's the other thing that gives it away. No, this is a, this is a cheap, not that cheap, American knockoff. Speaking of cheap knockoffs, Herod the King, we read about Herod the King. And if we don't, if we, if we, if we just, if all we read is, they went to King Herod and, and this, that, and the other, and King Herod did this, that, and the other, we, we're tempted to make assumptions about King Herod that are not correct. We can assume King Herod was born king. We'd be wrong. We can assume Herod was a secure king. We'd be wrong. We can assume Herod was liked by the good Jews because he massively rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. The, the Western Wall became the Wailing Wall. He built that up to shore up the, the foundations of the temple and massively rebuilt the temple. So you think all the good Jews would be like, he's a good guy, he builds a temple. We'd be wrong. He was a counterfeit king. We can assume that Herod was universally hated because he was a brutal dictator. We'd be wrong. Just. We were only just. Most people hated him. We can assume Herod was wise because he reigned for 34, 35 years in a time and place of incredible turmoil. We'd be wrong. He was just cunning. From Matthew. He was just cunning. So again, we read the Bible account, but without a little bit of thinking more about it, we don't see what's actually there. We just see, we see the words and we think, okay, right enough. But there's more to, there's more to this account than we think. I really did. I shouldn't have left mine at home, should I? I shouldn't have eaten them last night either. But true. Where were Mary and Joseph from? Nope. Nazareth. Nazareth. Do you know what? Where was Jesus born? <laughs> bingo, bingo bongo. Jesus was born in... So they're from Nazareth, which is, oh, I don't know, miles away. And then they, they, they do the little donkey thing. Little donkey, little donkey. So... Bethlehem, although the donkey is no more there than the uh, than a lot of other things out there. Yes, the donkey never gets mentioned, although it was a donkey. We all know that. We've all seen that on, on the Christmas cards. That must be true. <laughs> when did Matthew two, this bit I've just read, take place? Yonks after. Why am I giving Dave? Why have I given your wife some chocolate? I'm sorry. You can blame me when she's ill tomorrow. Years, a couple of years afterwards. Why were they still in Nazareth? Why haven't they gone home? It wasn't their city. They were from Bethlehem. Why haven't they gone home? We don't know. Yeah, I can, I can think of a number of reasons. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Christmas traffic's a murder. Couldn't get a taxi because it was all booked up. New Year, no, New Year, isn't it? The train's on strike, yeah. No, I don't think it's any of those things, actually. Uh, yeah. They only haven't gone home. But verse 11, verse 11 says, On coming to the house, the major did this, that, and the other. Not on coming to the stable, not on coming to the, to the, the place where the, 
where they, the animals were kept, they don't was, strongly suggest that they had settled in Bethlehem. And you think, well, why? Why, why, why didn't they go back to the place they grew up? Like I said at the start, Scripture says so much and so little at the same time. It leaves us so many more questions than it does answers a lot of the time. I mean, in the verses, verses after the verses I read, we see the family fleeing to Egypt, quite possibly financed by the gold that the Magi bring. That was Andy, wasn't it? And then returning later. But when they return, they don't come back to Bethlehem. They go back to Nazareth. So they, so they don't seem to have a great... It's not like they're really tied to Bethlehem, other than Jesus was born there. So you wonder, again, if, is, is there something in between those pages that we don't read? Was there another, another dream or a vision from God we're not told about? Did, they, did one of them have another a vision or dream that God said, just wait here? We're not done in this city yet. We're not done in this town yet. Is there something more that we're just not seeing? I have no idea. We don't know. We don't know. We don't, it's, it's one of those things that we, that we don't see. But it's interesting to think about, isn't it? That they didn't go home. They didn't go back to where all their, their mum parents were and their aunts and uncles and grandgrads and whatever were. But they stayed for some reason. I like to think they, they had a vision. I like to think that God... God said to him, stay here. Stay here. Wait. Wait. Wait here. Wait. I like to think that. Moving on. I'm going to skip, for time's sake, the kings bowing down to the king bit. Major bowing down to the king bit. Thank you. Down to the king of kings bit. I'm going to skip the Magi bringing the best they had being a reflection of the requirements of the Jews to bring the best they had to the temple, to God. And that being a reflection of how we should do the same, bring the best we have to God. I'm going to skip that bit. Slide straight into the what about us and now bit. What should we do? What should we take from this and what should we do? We should ask God to show us what we cannot see. Because our eyes are just this. We don't always see. Like Elijah did. Like we, like we can actually infer the Magi did when they were looking for the Messiah. And like God did without them even asking when God says to them, go another way home. They saw another way home. We ought to ask God to show us what we cannot see, to give us that gift. And 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the gift of discernment the gift of knowledge that they're, they're not earthly gifts some people have just got more sense than others that's just true some people are just have more knowledge than others they've read more they, they've they're, they're doctors or they're mechanics they just know more than mortal people about bodies cars and magnets but that's not, that's not the gift of knowledge. The gift of knowledge is a gift from God. It's a gift to see that which you otherwise you could not see. Otherwise you could not know. The gift of discernment isn't just knowing your right foot from your left foot. It's knowing right from wrong and seeing people's hearts, whether, they, whether they're for us or against us, whether, they, whether the words they say are the words they mean or whether they're just... I'm not going to use a. I'm not going to say, I was going to say that. Whether well, they're just not true, not being truthful. And Paul writing writing to the church in Philippi says, "Do not be anxious about everything, anything, but in everything, in prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus." Ask God present the petitions and requests. Ask God to see, to open your eyes. After the treasure in jars of clay verses in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul writes, For our light and momentary troubles 
are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all those things. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. What we should do is pray to God to open our eyes like he did to Elisha's servant to see not, not, the, sort of, not the temporary, temporal stuff that we're walking around in, but the eternal consequences of our words, our actions, of what we do, of what we say, of what we see, of what we do. Honestly, time and again, I come back to those, to Jesus saying, ask, seek, knock. And I think, Lord, open the eyes of your servant. Let me see. Give me the wisdom I was preaching about last time I stood here to see. See your ways and know your ways. Ask God to show us what we cannot see. Seek him out. Seek him out. Actively look for his signs. And obviously I don't mean, Paul did a great job a couple of weeks ago talking about nutcases that look for end, to, end times. Ooh, let's read Revelation and see if there's any end times. Are we living in end times? What did Paul say a couple of weeks ago? Are we living in end times? Yeah, we are. Were we living in end times 30 years ago? Yes, we were. Were we living in end times 100 years ago? Yes, we were. Will we if, if one or two of us might live in me still alive in 100 years, will they still live in end times? Yes, they will, because we're just in end times, because that's our time. That's, that's, Paul, God gave us a, Paul gave us a great illustration of why that's a waste of our precious time. When I, I mean the signs of his working in the world now. Look for the signs of him working now. There are signs of God working in the world now. There is, the worldwide church is expanding. You don't read what it says in the papers. The worldwide church is expanding. It's getting bigger. There are humongous churches all over the place. There are humongous churches in Africa. Do they know it's Christmas time in Africa? Yes, they do, because there's massive, great big churches doing today exactly what I'm doing today. There's, there, are, there are people in Africa stood up. Actually, it's not far short. They're not far short of GMT, so it'll be round about now. Stood up, preaching to thousands of people and saying much the same as I'm saying now. Yes, they have. They very well know it's Christmas in Africa. Also, there is snow in Africa on top of Mount Kilimanjaro. There's always snow. It's that high. Can you, do you think that, that song annoys me a little bit? <laughs> Every year it annoys me as well. Anyway, signs of his working in the world. I, I, I saw something the other day that was talking about um, people having dreams and visions of Jesus in their sleep. Non-Christians, Muslims, having waking up, having had a, a dream of Jesus saying to them, come to me, I'm the Messiah. That's amazing. Pray. Read scripture. Wait on him. Paul, Paul's been doing a series on, about waiting on the Lord. It's brilliant. If you haven't caught any of it, it's on the, on the magic thing. It's on the church website. It's on... Um, on Facebook, look back in our videos. It's on, it's on the church website as well. And like the mage I did, prepared, be prepared to move when he leads you, where he leads you, to find him where he is, to follow him where he goes. The mage I will, were actively waiting and looking for this sign. Are we actively waiting and looking for a sign? Are we actively waiting in our lives for a sign from God to say, go and talk to that person. Today is the day when you can talk to so-and-so about me. Today is the day to do this. Be prepared for it to cost you. It might even cost you stuff you treasure. The, the gifts of gold, frankincense, myrrh, have, uh, traditionally, historically, have meanings. Gold, gold is wealth, is power. Frankincense is worship. We give him, our, we give him our, our wealth, we give him our worship. Myrrh, myrrh is a, an embalming fluid. We give him our lives, we give him our deaths. We say, Lord, when I, I, I finish when you say I finished. I'll work until, I'll work doing your work until you say I finished and you call me home. 
and be prepared for him to take you places you never thought you'd go. I've got to be honest with you, when I became a Christian 30, lots of years ago, not quite 40, 38 years ago, I never thought he would take me here. Um, absolutely, yeah. I never thought he'd take me into, for, genuinely, I, I never thought he'd take me into leadership. I never thought he'd take me to do this. I just, be prepared for him to take you places that you never thought he'd go. Speak to people you never thought you'd speak to. Matthew 14, Peter's in a boat in fear for his life, in proper fear for his life. For all he's a sailor, he's in a storm and he's in proper fear for his life. And you can bet earned money he was praying out to God to see safety, to see him through to safety. And he sees Jesus walking on the water. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, Tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus just says one word. Come on. Come. And Peter gets down out of the boat and walks on the water towards Jesus. Verse 30. Matt 14, 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. So you have little faith. He said, why did you doubt? There are times when God the Father opening our eyes is enough. And we see, we see his plans, we see his purposes and our faith rises in us. And we continue upwards and onwards into whatever adventure he calls us into. And there are times, like then, when seeing it makes it worse. Makes it harder. They just are. The times when we when we see the stuff we've got to do, I think sometimes I think that's why God doesn't doesn't say, yeah, I want you to go over there and these are the steps. I want you to extend the building and these are the steps. Because if we saw the steps, we think, I ah, we go oh, no. I like that idea, but uh, but this bit, I'm not sure about this bit. And sometimes we do. Sometimes He, he opens our eyes and we see these see this bit here and we go, Lord, please. And he reaches out and catches our hands. The times when seeing it makes it worse, and in those times we need to reach out to Jesus and know he will catch our hands and save us from the storm. Get the band back. That's what it says next. Ask God to show us that you cannot see. Seek him out, finally wait the wait. When he tells you to move, move, otherwise wait. When Joseph and Mary didn't go home to Nazareth, they didn't stay where they were. You've, scripture implies that they moved and got on with their lives. Scripture implies that, that they weren't in the same place. Physically, they were in a different hostel, different abode. That's what I was looking for. And Paul has, has said some great stuff in the last few weeks. I'm not even going to try and summarize it. But a fair amount of what he was talking about was doing whilst waiting. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippi, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That working out, it's not an intellectual thing, like a maths problem. That's a different thing, that's a different word altogether. It's an instruction to act. Work out is like going to a gym, exercise, stretch, run, move, be, do, be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. Work out your salvation. Work it out. Work it into the world. Not in a, in a frantic way. That's, that's not how to work out at all. Because obviously I know a lot about going to the gym. But what I do know is, you need a plan. I'm talking to my lad, who, who does know a lot, you, you work on, you, you don't work on your legs two days in a row. You work on your legs, then you work on your, what are these bits called? Abs. You work on your abs, and then you work on your arms. And then you work on your legs again, then you work on your abs. You, you don't, you plan. 
You don't just run around like a nutcase. Work out your fear. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling in a considered, thoughtful, purposeful way. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. As members of one body, you are called to peace. And be thankful. Be thankful. Come on. First Thessalonians 5 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Pray opens your heart, opens your eyes to see what you cannot see. Because when you can see what you cannot see, when he opens your eyes to the things that you cannot normally see, you see him move. And you can't help but be thankful. Because when you see him move, he's moving for you. He's for us, not against us. And you can't help but be thankful. When you see how brilliant he is, how great and marvellous and wonderful he is, you can't help but be thankful. Because he is. When you see Christmas cards this year, thousand and one pictures that are just, <laughs> all the details are wrong. Just very wrong. Pray to God to open your eyes. See the details that you don't see. Pray to God to open your eyes to your friends. You can tell them about the details that they don't see. To give you opportunity to use this time to spread his word, spread his name. So the world is spreading his name. Heroes are spreading his name. We should do the same. If today I have nothing I've said makes any sense to you, if you don't know the God of peace in your life, if you don't know Heavenly Father, if you don't know Jesus as your Saviour, the Holy Spirit as your counsellor, strengthener, chain breaker, if nothing I've said gives you comfort, there is a comforter. If you sense the signs of God moving, if, you, if, if at the sort of periphery of your vision you think, God's moving here, I just can't quite... If you think Jesus is saying to you, come. If you want that peace that transcends understanding, there's a, there's a prayer we pray when we first follow him. And there's a prayer we pray when we want to remind ourselves. I invite you now to, to join me in this prayer. I'm, I'm, if you're online, you as well. Hopefully I haven't wandered off screen too much for you. We pray, Lord Jesus, I know I've done things wrong in my thoughts, my words and actions. There's so many good things I've not done, so many wrong things I have done. Sorry for the wrong things and turn from everything I know to be bad. You gave your life for me on a cross and gratefully I give my life back to you. Now I ask you to come into my life. Come in as my saviour to clean me, come in as my Lord to lead me. And I will serve you all the remaining days of my life.